Welcome to the Connected Campus Podcast, where we explore the ways that diverse professionals are working every day to optimize their efforts to recruit, retain, and graduate their students. This is a uh, very special episode for me uh, for this podcast episode that uh, I don't think I've really ever gotten the chance to talk to a board chairman, uh, somebody with this perspective. You know, I've talked to a lot of CEOs and presidents of institutions across different shows and everything. So uh, really excited for this conversation just to kind of bring in uh, that perspective and how it relates to kind of the path of my story and, uh, you know, anything else that comes up. So, you know, we'll probably have a wide ranging conversation, but uh, we'll start out, uh, Roy, if you want to uh, briefly introduce yourself and your professional background, and then we'll get to the rest of our conversation. Sure. Um, thanks, uh, Dustin. Um, my name is Roy McKelvey. I'm the chairman of Pathify. Um, my background is I'm originally an engineer. I worked for a couple of uh, industrial companies either side of my MBA and then spent, um, I guess, so 25 years or so in the private equity industry in the UK, continental Europe. Uh, I lived and worked in Asia um, for a number of years, and I'm currently based in Sydney in Australia. Um, for the last, um, I guess, eight, nine years, uh, I've been doing my own thing. So I'm chairman of uh, a bunch of different software companies um, uh, with varying things education, banking software, safety and wellness, um, security software, um, uh, wealth management software, um, uh, obviously Pathify being a US company, uh, a couple of the businesses I'm involved with are based in the UK and another three or four are based here in Australia. So that's me. Interesting. Yeah, because there's a lot of like things in my head just like, and we'll start, I guess, sort of chronologically, because I think obviously like you have such a like, wide birth of experience and things that you're sort of involved with both like geographically and you know the focus of the companies and I mean, that's really interesting but like how did it all start like how did it sort of like because i feel like it's probably something that sort of begets itself like if you are a board chairman it's you know they sort of like oh okay you kind of understand what this role is like and it can sort of if you're you know open to it it can sort of uh kind of create more opportunities and everything but sort of like how did that start for you the the kind of whole, the you know becoming the role of a board chairman um I guess it's kind of a, it's kind of partly a function of my background and what I spent most of my professional career doing as a private equity guy. Um, and uh, I'd love to tell you it was after deep strategic reflection, but it was more kind of by accident almost as well. So what do I mean by that? When you work in private equity, certainly when I started in it, you end up sitting in board meetings at a very, very young age. So. I was sitting in board meetings when I was 26 or thereabouts. I started doing that. Um, and I'm sitting in board meetings where everybody else in the board meeting is twice my age, basically, and has 10 times my professional experience. So I was in my mid 20s sitting in board meetings with guys who are all the age I am now and older. And so what does that mean? It means you spend a lot of time just absorbing how to do things, how not to do things. Um, hopefully you learn uh, the good traits uh, and learn to avoid the bad traits of how boards work and don't work. And so when I um, uh, was in my sort of late 40s, um, I was the CEO of a, a privately owned conglomerate uh, based here, headquartered here in Sydney, but had stuff all over the world we had 35 sites in the US and Spain and the UK and Germany and other places. Um, and I, I was approached about taking a chairman's role for uh, a, a large um, privately owned investment business, part-time role. Um, and I took that and it sort of morphed into me doing this in, in various other companies. Um, my background is originally I'm an engineer, um, but that's production and manufacturing engineering. And so I have, I know enough about software to be dangerous. And so, so somebody, um, uh, sort of kind of picked me as someone out of the unique mix of skills that they want, they thought would be interesting for a particular software business. And that's how I ended up doing it. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess it's just that idea of like, obviously most people they'll be like, Oh, when I, you know, grow up, I want to be a board chairman or something, but like, you kind of like, you had that route where you had exposure to it. And there's certainly like, you know, 
people that were in similar position, I'm sure that like had that exposure and like, like if that, I don't think I'd ever want to do that, but like you were at least exposed to it and you're sort of just like observing and it's like, you know, what to do, what not to do, like you said, and at least like when that opportunity presented itself to you, where it's like, you can reference back and be like, I think, yeah, like I kind of know what that is yeah. more so than maybe somebody else who's just going in blind is just like, Oh, cool. Wow. Like they do it. And then they end up not liking it. You had sort of that shorthand, um, which is really great. And I guess just like, you know, partially for my edification, but then like, if you had to just kind of like in a nutshell, the sort of like, you know, dictionary definition of like, what is the experience like of being a board chairman? And I guess if you can kind of just put the cherry on top of it is like, what do you enjoy most about being, you know, a board chairman? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the, the definition of it is to try and be the person who stands back from the day to day and looks at the business holistically um, and and has to bring a different perspective to what that business is doing compared to the chief executive. It's a, it's a classic thing of, um, if I use a sort of quasi-military metaphor, which is, you know, the chief executive and the executives in the business, they're in the trenches kind of, you know, fighting the good fight. Um, and the chairman's kind of, um, for better or worse, is the sort of general in a helicopter kind of trying to survey the whole battlefield. And, and, and the two give you very different perspectives on what's happening. And hopefully, if you have a good relationship with your chief executive, then the two of you can have the sort of conversations that um, are not political, um, where you come from different ends of the spectrum to solve a common problem in a way that is uh, constructive and non-confrontational. That's how I think about it. Um, it doesn't always, it's not, it's not always that way, but that's, that's the, mm -hmm. the aim. Yeah. Well, and I think too, just before maybe, you know, you share sort of any favorite part of it, or even just maybe like a favorite anecdote or something like I'm thinking as you're saying that where it's like, okay, deliberately, you know, a board chairman should be able to sort of, take that outside, maybe, you know, impartial perspective or something in consultation and be sort of a, you know, uh, a guide to uh, a CEO. And it's like, sometimes I know like people who are CEOs become board chairmen or like, you know, there's some, maybe some shared background experiences, but then there's certain personality types where it's like the CEO would never want to be like, take their hand off the wheel. Like, Oh my God, I can never be the chairman of like either this company or some other company. Like I've got to be there like in the trenches then like vice versa, where somebody's like, no, I prefer being a chairman of this like organization. Like I don't, I, I don't want to have to be like doing the thing. It's more so just like, Hey, here's my point of view. I've surveyed kind of the whole landscape and the context, like do this, what you will. Like, as long as you're like at the end of the day, like, still steering the organization towards, you know, being profitable and, you know, sort of growing and all these other sort of things that I just can imagine that sort of thing where like, if certain people kind of gravitate, maybe even depending on sort of where they are in their life or what they're looking for, where it's just like, you know, they would definitely want to do one or the other, or definitely would, would not imagine themselves ever doing one or the other. It's just like a level I, I of think, control. I think, I think, or, that, I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's actually uh, quite a perceptive observation, if you don't mind me saying so, because one of the things that um, uh, if you spoke to any experienced private equity uh, executive, they would say is that the most difficult thing that a chief executive um, has is transitioning to be a chairman. So a lot of chairmen are people who are ex-chief executives. I'm an ex-chief executive. Um, uh, and the biggest problem they tend to have is when you're the CEO, everybody reports to you. You have hard lines to a number of senior executives. You have within reason hire and fire authority um, um and you're the person that says dustin why haven't you done this you need to go and do that um uh when you're the chairman you don't have that authority and you shouldn't try to exercise that authority and the problem that a lot of chief executives have is they have a successful career and then they, they get their first chairmanship and they're saying to people go and do this go and do that um and and that's a really hard shift to make. It sounds an easy shift. You kind of go, well, it's just a different job, isn't it? And if you're a chief executive, you've got to be a smart person. Uh, and that's true as well. But emotionally, it's very hard for a lot of people to shift. And when I was a private equity guy, um, even though I was much younger, obviously, the number of times you would, I would end up counseling a chief executive who had more experience than me, who was twice my age, that they really weren't doing the chairman's job really, really well. And they couldn't kind of go in and, start behaving the way they used to behave as a chief executive they had to learn to take a step back 
Um, and um, I sometimes say is you, you've got to accept that when you become chairman, you become someone of influence and uh, a degree of authority. But the rank that you hold in the corporate hierarchy means something different to what you think it means. You know, you, as a chairman, you're at the top of the, the organizational chart, but you can't be the person that tells everybody what to do in minute detail. You've got to stand back from that. And if you like, you've got to be prepared almost to let people make mistakes in a way that you wouldn't do that as a chief executive. Mm. Yeah, it's just more of a like strategy, like sort of the like scope or cone of sort of like, okay, we're, we're going in this direction. How we end up getting there, you could kind of zig and zag as long as it's sort of like, yeah. You know, still within kind of a general there's, there's frame a, of reference. There's a, there's a phrase that um, somebody else told me once, which I like to try and claim as my own sometimes about the best way to the best way to define a relationship between the the, the chairman and the CEO, which is that the the chairman uh, looks after and manages the board, and the board is where he defines strategy, and then the chairman defines a box. And in that box, he says to the chief executive, you have freedom in this box. And when you get to that edge of that box, whichever it's this edge or that edge or that edge, then that's where I step in. And that, and that, and, and defining that correctly is, is very important because you want the chief executive to show a degree of entrepreneurial spirit uh, and you don't want to constrain that. But by the same token, as the chairman of the board and the board collectively, the directors collectively, you have a responsibility to the shareholders. And so you've got to act, make sure the company's acting in their best interest. So that's, it's getting that balance right that's really important. And I guess just to make sure we don't lose it, if there's one little like gem anecdote or thing that you remember, like kind of favorite memory of being a chairman, because yeah, it's such a like interesting relationship. And I think just if you get to sort of experience in some sort of like milestone or success, I guess is what I'm sort of imagining, just anything that sort of captures that sort of like, you know, uh, collective effort that sort of... Uh, you know, your role can sort of help an organization get towards? Um, well, the, 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 there's, there's, there's all those positive and negative things. Um, the positive thing is when you help somebody to an outcome, um, when you can see that you're having a discussion with the chief executive and you can see their light bulb moment go on. Um, that's, that's the thing that's usually the most personally rewarding. Um, but you've also got to accept that, you know, the chairman being a chairman also involves doing some of the dirty work. Um, you know, the chairman's the person who fires the chief executive at the end of the day. Um, and that is never a pleasant experience for anybody. Right? It's not, it's obviously not a pleasant experience for the person being fired, but it's not a pleasant experience for the person doing the firing. I mean, I, mean, I think, I think I've fired a lot of people. I fired my first chief executive when I was 28 and he was, he was, I'm going to say he was 50 or something. Um, and I've done it quite a few times since then. And I've never, ever, ever enjoyed it. Uh, and I think some people who are much more um, sanguine about it, um, you know, go out mind firing people. I kind of go, well, that's a sociopath, right? You know? Um, but so, so, there's, so, so there's an ugly side to it, a necessary but ugly side to being a chairman as well as the more, more common and much more rewarding one of, of, working with a chief executive and helping them to deliver a great outcome for, for the company, for the employees, for the shareholders, for the customers that they're serving. Um, mm -hmm. And I prefer to think about that than the, sometimes the, the more necessary, but uglier things. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that, and I think of like, you know, always in metaphors and stuff like that. It's just like the idea of like, you know, you got like some injury and you've got to just like, well, we got to cut off the arm so the rest can survive. Like this, this nobody's going to like this. Like, I don't want to have to do it. You don't want to have to experience it, but like, we got to keep the rest of this going. And just the idea too, of like that also in a vacuum, if like there wasn't, you know, and obviously some organizations don't depending, I guess, sort of where they are, but like without an outside sort of objective lens, it could just be like, well, the CEO has almost like no accountability and they're just sort of like going whatever direction they want to go. And they might just kind of tank it. And that would be a shame if somebody could be like, hey, well, maybe if you go this way or if we have to be like, we got to hit a reset button here and, you know, whatever, just so we can keep, you know, keep this going without it kind of crash and burning and stuff. So, yeah, it, it is it is fascinating stuff. But I think, you know, I know it's often the case, but not a requirement, maybe 
and correct me if I'm wrong, I guess, but like the idea that like typically people are on boards or chairmen of organizations where they have like, you know, invested in it or part, you know, if it is like private equity or some sort of structure that is sort of like, you know, supplementing this organization. So they have sort of that vested interest in sort of, you know, helping you steer the ship. So, you know, how, because since you have so many like different organizations all over the world and everything that you uh, are a part of, like, how do you like evaluate even like which ones you want to get involved with? Because I guess if it's like, more so relationship driven or what i guess it's just like any sort of like kind of shorthand for how you sort of go through that process. <clears throat> Look, lots lots of people lots of people have different views about how they decide who to um work with um i guess i'm kind of really lucky and i don't have to work with anybody um you know i don't want to which is which is an enormous an enormous luxury and a privilege um so for me it, it always comes down to the people um the um, the relationship between a chairman and CEO is absolutely pivotal. If if you don't believe you can trust one another um, uh, and have that sort of relationship where you are um, confidant, father confessor, problem solver, all of that sort of stuff rolled into one, then you're not really going to be that effective. Um, and trust is hard to build and easy to lose. And so for me, I try and make a judgment call on the individuals. Um, and do I think that person is a person to I can work with? And and I always say one thing, if, if I'm getting to the point where we're saying, well, are we going to work together? And uh, are we going to do this? And, you know, I'm going to be the chairman, you're going to be chief executive. I always say one thing to all of the CEOs that I've work with. And I, and I said this to Chase Williams, the CEO of Panther Bio, when we were kicking it off. I said, um, if we're going to we have one rule, right? You know, never lie to me. If you tell me everything, tell me the worst thing that's going on, and I will work with you to fix it, but never lie to me. Um, and, I, and I got taught that by somebody else. So, so that's the way I think about it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's refreshing, and it, it it was like you said, like is like parental or something, where it's like you want that like for your kids, just like just be honest with me, like if something's going on, just let me know yeah. and I'll help you. Like it's you know, uh, but you know, and I guess it's like a whole different conversation of like you know, certain individuals or organizations or whatever. Like there is almost like maybe even like deliberately, I would imagine like distance where it's like, it's all just sort of like numbers in a spreadsheet and all that. It's like, well, we're going to do this much money because it could be this return. But it's like a lot of other people are doing it based on relationships. Like, can we actually work together? Because like, if I did all that other stuff and then I met you and then I was like, oh no, like this, like it'll be like, this is going to gel. Like that would, you know, you can really, you know, this can't, I guess, like back people, out of it yeah. or something. But yeah. You know, numbers, numbers are a way of, measuring performance, allocating resources, uh, prioritizing what you, what you want to do. But fundamentally, businesses are just people, right? They're just individuals. And if you're going to work together, you've got to be able to work together, which sounds like incredibly obvious, but but people also often don't think about it. I think, well, I don't really like Johnny or Sally or whoever, but I'll see if I can work with them. I'm lucky I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, I sort of, mm. I'm really lucky that I can say I like Sally I can work with Sally. Sally, I think, can work with me. Therefore, that's the that's the threshold thing for me when deciding to get involved with someone. Mm -hmm. Well, and that even like in sort of the breath of fresh air, like on, on multiple levels, one that is just like very people centered. So just, you know, uh, like it allows for sort of like a malleability or sort of like a diversity or whatever, where it could just be where it's like, OK, your personality, like, you know, kind of who you work well with. And then there's going to be somebody else who can work well with other people. Like, it's not just so like prescriptive kind of like, well, you have to be like this if you're a board chairman and you have to be like this if you're seated. Like it would just be sort of every pot finding its lid or something, you know, like any of those sort of kind of uh, turns of phrases and stuff. But um, so, yeah, I guess, I, yeah, it's, all of this again is just, it's very educational. So I appreciate you kind of, you know, uh, breaking it down for me. But, uh, and I feel like this is going to be another great thing to kind of capture as part of sort of, pathify lore so obviously you went through something like this as you met chase and you know decided to work together so like what made you decide to get involved in the education space like, i don't know if you have been involved prior or since or how that's taken shape but like and how did what made you decide to get involved with pathify specifically sure um uh well i 
obviously I've been to school, so I know a little bit about education. Um, <laughs> although it was a long time ago. Um, uh, not quite in the quill pen and ink and carrier pigeon days, but uh, it, it was a day when it com- you had to go to a computer lab to use a computer. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I got introduced to the business through actually a, a chap I know here in Sydney. And um, uh, Chase wasn't the first person I met. It was actually a guy called Cameron Reynolds, who was the chairman before me. And um, we met just before the start of the pandemic. Um, sort of four years ago, and um, had, a, <clears throat> had a really interesting chat. Um, I think the business at the time had half a dozen US colleges as clients. Um, they had a few hundred thousand dollars of revenue. Um, and um, I'm going to say kind of 20 employees or something. Um, and the thing that made me really interested in it was, uh, and this is betraying my age, you know, when I, when I went to university, when I was 17, um, uh, on the day of matriculation, you went into a huge hall and your picture was taken and you walked around all these desks and you got various things, your reading list, your map of the campus and stuff. And you came away with this bag with all these bits of paper in it. And, and I, up until four years ago, quite naturally assumed that everything was on one of these now and that everything was just an easy app and an easy access to everything. And so when I got introduced to this, I was told these guys have got this platform. Oh my God, there must be, there must be loads of those. And of course there are other ones out there, but I couldn't believe once I looked into it, how clunky a lot of universities were um, in terms of how they managed what is fundamentally just a thing about communication. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean you know, we can, we can, um, we can dress up whatever Pathify does any way you want, but fundamentally, it's a communication medium. It's 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 a, it's a mechanism for the university lecturers, students, uh, all to communicate properly about all of the myriad complex things that they do in an efficient way. And I was really surprised by that and excited by it at the same time. And. As I met the people, I discovered that I liked the people. I liked the way they thought about things. I liked their attitude. Uh, I liked that they were grafters. Um, you know, Jason James had been sort of like, you know, fighting the good fight to try and get this thing going for a while. Uh, and they seemed to have some some traction. And that was the thing that attracted me to it. And that's why eventually, after many months of discussions, I got the investment consortium together to, to, put, to put the deal together and to hopefully help Pathify on to the position it is now where we've got, you know, over a hundred schools and, and, uh, we're not just a U.S. business anymore. We've got clients in, uh, Australia, we've got the, our first client in Europe, you know, so, so the business is doing really well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of just funny, like, cause you know, trying to get more and more sort of back into the history and lore of like, you know, uh, pathified everything is like, uh, you know, I just learned about them and like, sort of, you know, I joined the team like as the recording of this, like six months ago and had met them, uh, you know, a few months prior to starting working there. But like the, kind of just like a similar sentiment of like, you know, it just like clicks like you, you, know, you just did your research and everything. And it's just like, whoa, like, like what? <laughs> like, and then it just sort of like you could see this opening and it's like, wow, OK, yeah, I think this, you know, could be a good opportunity. And, you know, then sort of like having it pursue from there, if it was like that was at least the catalyst to be like, OK, there might be something here. Like this is not yeah. just sort of like, you know, another, you know, kind of random pitch or something. And, you know, I stumbled across a booth at a show floor and uh-huh. saw the platform and it just like clicked. It was like, wow, yeah, this is great. And I just sort of like kept in contact and very thankful now to have had the opportunity to join the team. But I'm like, like, I kind of want to keep trying to like see and building the lore of like people have been around either like, you know, around as long as I have or longer of just like how they sort of found out about how to fire, how it sort of all came to be and seeing how much that's sort of like core of this, like, you know, just really kind of focused, committed strategy to sort of filling that gap in just, yeah, yeah in simplest terms, like a communication gap between all the different stakeholders, uh-huh. uh, you know, in the campus community. So because um, I guess, yeah, this idea, like the elevator pitch just seems to make a lot of sense and resonate. And then it's just like, you know, you have to figure out all the other politics and this and that, the other thing to like, you know, end up working together. And that's, you know, kind of the case with anything, you know, there's not much that 
uh, people just kind of like, you know, buy on impulse or something, especially something yeah. is like kind of a big investment like this. But um, so, yeah, that's, that's really great. Yeah, just kind of because uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I've talked with many people, you know, besides, you know, like Chase and stuff. But like, I guess that sort of were were brought in at some kind of further point in the history of, of Pathify. So it's yeah. really cool to hear. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's a great, Pathfinder is a great example of how a couple of guys had a really cool idea about solving a problem. And then the, the, the politics and institutional inertia that you often find in some markets to actual change and, and where everybody knows that such and such a thing is a problem. And everybody, you sit down and you go, yeah, it's a problem. We need to fix it. And we go, well, here's a solution. Oh, that's a really great solution. But nobody wants to pull the trigger in terms of making the decision to, to say, let's do that. And higher ed is, and I've, I've seen this in different spaces, um, higher ed is really prone to institutional inertia, right? You know, it's just, just we just keep doing the things the way we keep doing things, which, which is counterintuitive if you think about it, because higher education is where we train the people who are supposed to be the brightest and the best, who are going to make the changes that make life better for everybody. But those institutions themselves are, are, are what some of the most institutions that are most resistant to change anywhere within uh, the mm-hmm. community as a whole. It's, 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 it's funny and peculiar at the same time. Yeah. Well, and it's just something that always rings in my head is like, you know, if you ever sort of get frustrated with that, it's like, like, well, like, you know, because it's on one hand kind of kind of exceptional, like it's its own thing, but it is very similar to like, you know, health systems or like governments and all like they're just like these huge enterprises that are just kind of sluggish and like are doing really important work, but just can't seem to get out of their own way sometimes. So they do yeah. need, need sort of like a lot of partners and other people to kind of come in to sort of help kind of amplify their full potential and everything. And yeah, it's almost like that there's an alternate universe where, you know, Chase and everybody like had the idea and maybe saw that it was like, you know, working, but all and hitting kind of the walls of the inertia and just sort of like gave up on it. But obviously like, I'm very grateful and so many other people have benefited that they, I feel like took it as like a challenge or an opportunity because like, we know that we have an opportunity here. This is a great idea. We're so, you know, so we're committed to keeping at this and keep sort of making it better. So it's like the naysayers can kind of like not have any sort of ground to stand on. It's just like, yeah, I mean, this is an incredible platform and tool and, you know, it keeps getting better and everything. So uh, when, uh, when I, um, not long after I just got introduced to Pathify, um, and Chase and James have been talking about this sort of whole institutional inertia thing. They used, they used a different phrase. That's my phrase. But um, uh, and I thought, well, hmm, I thought that, that, I can understand that, but surely it can't be that bad. And I, ca- I called up a friend of mine from my school days who um, who, who who was a professor at a, until recently was a professor. He was a professor still when I called him at a big university in the UK. He's an actual nuclear physicist, right? <laughs> and um, and he's been a friend of mine for forty years since we were teenagers. And I said to him, Alan, you know, is, is this is this true? Is this is this how universities operate? He said, Oh, it's way worse than that. <laughs> and he started describing how the two universities where he'd spent you know twenty thirty years of his uh, postdoctoral career and how they operated and explained the sort of petty jealousies and how decisions were made, but usually not made and the, the, the lack of incentives to do things. And, and it kind of horrified me as a citizen, but made me recognize that it, it was also an opportunity to make a difference. And I think, I think that's actually what Pathify is doing that by improving that communication thing. Cause it's all, it's all about communication at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. And like everything just being so like people centered and then like, even just kind of arguing back to what, you were saying about the sort of your relationship with organizations as like chairman investor and those sort of things, like it being relationship driven. It's like education is kind of the same thing. And it is just the idea when you sort of like break down everything else. It's just like, we're all just humans just trying to help each other or do whatever yeah. you know, like, and you can kind of like get more Zen about it and try to like have that help inform kind of strategy or how you sort of go about things and all that. Yeah. So, and it's like, yeah, it applies in higher education as well. Like it's, it's yeah. yeah, it's like, it's the politics, it's the relationships and, you know, these sort of cultures and traditions, whatever. Um, but uh, we'll end though, uh, looking ahead towards the future, you know, we've got a little insight into the origin story of Pathify and your relationship uh, uh, with the with the team and everything. Uh, what are you excited about when you think about Pathify's future? Um, 
I, I think there's, 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 there's probably two or three things that sort of excite me. One is that even though we are now a business that sort of deals with more than 100 schools, um, um, you know, we've still barely scratched the surface in terms of the size of the market, even even just within the continental US. Um, and um, uh, so the opportunity for continued growth is really, really exciting because I, I think there's still a huge market that we can we can go out and uh, bring our solution to those universities. But I also think I'm also really excited about some of the other things that we can bring into our platform because the platform in terms of its um, UX experience, uh, in terms of the interface between the participants is um, uh, incredibly intuitive and easy to use. And I, and I think is a great solution for universities, allows, allows them to do things better. Um, but because we've got a, a middleware solution, that also gives us greater flexibility about how we can link in with all the other, other systems that are out there. But I also think there's a, there's a number of, um, areas where we can bring new products and feature sets to augment the fundamental communication communicating nature of what we deliver for universities and colleges and that sort of stuff in terms of targeted product development um i think is is really really exciting because because we've got some really interesting ideas that we're developing around that um to enhance the student experience um to enable the universities to continue to improve how they communicate, um, hopefully to help universities reduce kind of friction costs and all of this sort of stuff. And that, that again, I think excites me because it, it's not just about us saying, hey, here's a product we've developed and let's go and sell it everywhere. We're actually going to be continually improving that product. And, um, you know, Chase and I talk about that every week. Um, and there's some really, really interesting and, and cool, cool ideas that the guys are working on and, Hopefully, we'll be announcing them in the next few months. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it, uh, definitely, uh, folks who are listening to this, if you've not listened to uh, one of our previous sort of internal uh, kind of GM session episodes here with uh, another recent addition t- uh, to the team, Jeff Ledoux, uh, he was talking a little bit about sort of the development process of, on the product team, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's awesome just to see the sort of continued sprints and sort of just you know improvements, whether they are just sort of like small quality of life improvements or the more like sizable things. That that's just like really baked into kind of the DNA of, you know, uh, the team here, just kind of the continuous and, improvement. And Jeff's, um, Jeff's, been a, Jeff's been a great hire for us because what he brings is he's kind of been in the belly of the beast, as it were. Um, and so he, he understands intuitively how big colleges and universities think, but he also understands what they want and what they need. Uh, and the insights he's bringing to that, I think, are, are going to be, really helpful for us as a business. And they're also going to be really helpful for us in terms of delivering a solution that universities and colleges need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I'll make sure to nudge him if uh, he wasn't already going to and be like, hey, you should definitely uh, listen to this episode because uh, you a little uh, thumbs up here. But um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate, uh, I mean, the kind words about uh, the team and, you know, everything that we're all uh, working on together and uh, just getting to hear a little bit about your background and your perspective and just sort of how all this kind of stuff works of trying to, you know, grow a business and, you know, how uh, someone like yourself kind of helps with that. But um, yeah, just really appreciate your time and um, yeah, just sharing pleasure. all that you did. My pleasure. Great stuff, Dustin. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to The Connected Campus. Please leave a five-star review for the show and share it so others can discover us. Make sure to also subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you in the next episode of The Connected Campus.